Welcome everybody. Uh, my name is Jeff Nathanson. I'm executive director of the Museum of Sonoma County, and we have a really great program for you tonight. We're so excited to have three dynamic artists who are in our current exhibition and um, a moderator who will lead us through the presentations and a discussion that I know will be inspiring, engaging, and will probably have you talking about um, the importance of um, women in the arts for months to come. Um, before we get started, just a few uh, words. Uh, first of all, thank you to all of you for participating and um, the attendees for being here tonight. And I want to um, let you know that now that Sonoma County is um, oh, Melly Roberts, uh, yes, your, your cameras and sound are off. <laughs> so um, the only people who are on camera tonight are the presenters. So um, attendees, don't worry about it. This is um, being a, uh, is presented as a webinar. Anyway, the um, exhibition that we have on view right now, and it's installed in our um, contemporary galleries, is 35 artists from our permanent collection. And the three artists who are, are featured tonight are three women who are in our collection, but also have recently shown with us uh, over the past few years, Donna Brookman in an exhibition in 2018, uh, Linda Vallejo and Maria de, de Los Angeles uh, in an exhibition, uh, two different exhibitions in 2019. Um, but tonight's um, uh, program will be fo uh, focused on their work, but I just wanna give you a little bit of context about the 35 artists exhibition before we get started tonight. We mined our collection in order to find artworks that represented the modern and contemporary era of art making. Um, we do have a phenomenal collection that in, includes 19th century California landscapes and some other historic works. But what we really wanted to look at were 20th century and 21st century works and primarily works by living contemporary artists. You can find the exhibition um, 35 on our website and Katie just put into the chat um, a link so you can uh, follow the virtual tour. And also there's a virtual background, which um, if you want to use that um, and pretend you're in the gallery, uh, that's a fun thing to do. We are planning now that Sonoma County is in the red tier, finally, after all this time, um, we're out of the purple tier. Our museum will reopen limited uh, hours and limited capacity, but in April, um, early April. We don't have the exact date yet, but it'll be really soon. So we're looking forward to that. Yay. Um, all of you who are members of the museum, thank you so much for your support. Those of you who are not members, please consider joining um, our museum, like all museums and cultural institutions nationwide, need your support now more than ever. The pandemic has definitely taken a toll, but it's also inspired us to reach out to the public and to the art community and to the cultural community in uh, creative ways, especially online. But as we prepare to reopen, we also need your support. So uh, you can make a donation online to support this program and others like it. That way we can keep them free. And uh, we just put that in the chat. Thank you very much, Katie. And um, I also want to thank um, Jenny Bath, who is our technical support tonight. Um, our staff is the hardest working staff in, in the museum world, and we so appreciate them. And our board is also the hardest working board in the museum world and representing our board of directors uh, and the, uh, who is the chair of our art committee, uh, Estelle Rogers. And we're so thrilled to have you as the moderator of tonight's panel. Estelle, thank you so much. Uh, without further ado, I'm gonna turn the program over to Estelle and our three artists. And um, I'm going to uh, go off screen until later on and I'll see you again, but I'm so looking forward to the conversation. Thank you all for being here.
Thank you, Jeff. Really appreciate it. Uh, as Jeff said, my name is Estelle Rogers and I'm on the board of the museum and it's my job tonight to do a little bit of framing of the discussion before we get started. Framing seems like an appropriate thing to do with uh, in a museum panel, so that's what I'll do. Um, first, the, we have this discussion during Women's History Month, and it just happens that Women's History Week, which of course preceded there being a Women's History Month, was, was uh, invented in Santa Rosa, California. A group of Santa Rosa women came together in the late 1970s and decided that there was something missing from the history books, women. And that this coalition met and formed the National Women's History Project in 1980 uh, with the goal of writing women back into history. And that coalition in 1980 went further and, and the movement went national. And finally, in 1987, Congress converted it into make it make uh, Women's History Month the entire month of March. So here we are in the month of March and um, probably long overdue talking about women in the arts. Uh, you've probably noticed, as I have lately, that um, the, the negative term is identity politics, and there has to be a positive term, but I think that the, the, there's been a lot of attention to groups and group identity in, in the world um, in recent months and probably the last year or two particularly. And why not women in the arts? Um, I think it's really a uh, high time that we talked about the, the work of women and their lives in the art world, which has always been quite challenging to women. Uh, and I think that, you know, that's going to be the nature of this discussion. I myself am a lawyer and remember the time when they used to identify people as, uh, you know, the woman lawyer. Um, I think that's that time has passed. Um, I think we still, however, identify artists as women artists and uh, black artists as black artists. And there's an awful lot of that that continues to go on. And we'd be interested in your views, you women artists, uh, as to how that strikes you and whether that's, you know, that's something to be welcomed or not. So without further discussion by me, we'll probably get into all those subjects and many more uh, a little later. I think that um, it's time to go to the slides. And first I'll introduce uh, Donna Brookman, who, uh, whose slides will be presented first. Donna's uh, been a painter for a long time in this area. She lives in Berkeley and she's do done a lot of work on artist books and prints, including uh, using her heart to accompany poetry and myth. Uh, and you can see, I think already that, uh, that it's very appropriate in that context. So I will now turn it over to Donna who can talk about her work. Thank you. Thank you, Estelle and Jeff. I decided to start with this installation photograph because this will be familiar to many people in this audience. This was the installation that was part of the installation that was done at Museum of Sonoma County for Jeff's beautiful time and place inaugural exhibit in 2018. Um, and it was such a privilege to participate in that. And I wanna say from the perspective of an artist that working with this institution is an absolute joy. They are wonderful to deal with. They are so supportive and they serve such an important function, showing work that is not necessarily easily shown like these pieces. These pieces are very large, nine feet tall. If there aren't a lot of spaces that can accommodate them. And I had this beautiful long 90 foot wall for eight of them. You can't even see them in the shot, but there were eight of them anyway. So I'm very grateful to this institution for the opportunities they provide, not just for me, but for many other artists. Um, also, the idea of a program for Women's History Month is something near and dear to my heart. I am, I too, like Estelle, you know, I was in school in the 70s and we had a woman faculty member and a woman graduate student and the art history text had no women included, absolutely none. And so I think that it's terrifically important to recognize the problem of erasure of women's work in, and in, in the arts. I mean, you know, everyone studies Robert Delaunay and doesn't study Sonia Delaunay and, or, or in the realm of music, um, 
everyone knows Robert Schumann, they don't know Clara Schumann. I mean, the, the women get erased. And this is a huge challenge to deal with because you're really talking not just about individual successes, you're talking about a, a cultural history that's inclusive. So anyway, onward to the next slide, please. So the, after doing the Palace of Memory, the Palace of Memory was a huge project, 40 paintings. I decided to turn the canvas sideways and work with a landscape space. And these, as you can see, got denser and more complicated and also, but they also have a kind of inherent order to them that um, I love. I love the way sym an el symmetrical elements structure and organize the space to suggest some sort of deep order in the chaos. Uh, next slide, please. This one also in that series, these are nine feet long and five feet high. So this is one of the later pieces in this group. And I have to admit that I got to this point and I felt like I was wrestling an alligator. It was such a challenging process dealing with the scale. Somehow the scale horizontally was much tougher than the scale vertically. I can't say why, I don't know why, but uh, I decided I was done with this process and retreated to back to working on paper, which is always what I do when I'm in a transition mode, when I have, need to explore lots of possibilities. Next slide, please. Uh, this is a print that was done in, well, th this is related to the print in the, in the museum's collection, but it, um, it, 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 uh, it was done later. The, uh, excuse me, Bob, I, I need to have you go, please. I can't sign. That's all right. Um, just go. Um, this, uh, I'm sorry, I got distracted. My husband is having trouble signing in. Um, this uh, was part of a, a big series of prints that um, I did and of, that were amalgams of, of river drawings. And um, it was that I, I often use collage or drawing processes or, and it's anything that will open up the process and create new possibilities. Next slide. So this is a studio shot from the spring. This was done, I, this, I think this is about April. I was working on a lot of small format work. I had been looking at tantric art and thinking about chaos and stability and thinking about creating work that had this sense of movement and energy and chaos, but also had a, a, a form that you could stabilize yourself with. So I definitely think of these as sort of meditative, meditative images. Um, these are all smaller pieces, 18 by 24. There are a lot of them, as you see, there are more than is up here. Um, and they influence the work to come. Go ahead, next slide. So, you can see the relationship between this piece and the previous. Uh, these are 30 by 40 moderate size panels. Next, please. And I, I think this is just such a time of transition and chaos and yet possibility. And I wanted them to be lighter and I wanted them to feel that sense of openness and air. I think of them as wind paintings but also with a, a, a meditation element in them. Next, please. This is a diptych with the, they, they're very, I always get frustrated seeing my work on, on a computer screen because these are very tactile and there are many, many layers building up that white. Many, it's, you know, there's, if you could see the actual painting, <laughs> it would be more satisfying than the screen, but that's, that's always the way it is. Next slide. This one, three by six feet. Next slide. Oh, so that's it. Um, so that's, that's the direction the work is taking now. I'm still working small format. 
and uh, just seeing where it leads. Don't know where it's going. That's usually the case. I work until I feel like I've explored what I need to find in it, and then it shifts in some way. So thank you. Thank you, Donna. Um, I, I wanted to mention something that I forgot before, which is if anybody has questions, please put them in the Q&A um, at the bottom of your screen, and we will get to them um, after we have a discussion among ourselves, which will follow our third artist. So it'll, it'll all become clear. Uh, let me introduce Linda. Linda Vallejo creates work that visualizes what it means to be a person of color uh, in the United States. Um, I think that she's had a lot of education in, in uh, Latino and, and Chicano uh, indigenous culture, and uh, that informs her work. And we will let Linda, uh, she's actually in Arizona right now, but she's usually in Southern California. So she, she uh, lives in Southern California, uh, and we will have Linda talk about her slides. Thank you very much. And thank you to the Museum of Sonoma County for including me in the exhibition and also including me in this panel opportunity. It's always a pleasure to share the work and I'm really happy to have a series of slides for you today. Uh, for the last uh, 10 years or so, I've been creating pieces around the concept of the color brown. And I've been, uh, the work talks about the, specifically about the politics of color and class in the United States. And as a Mexican American, third generation Californian, I have a lot of fun with the uh, data and with this wonderful milk chocolate brown, which I paint any number of items. I go to antique malls, buy pricey antiques and paint them brown to put uh, culture on its head, to put history on its head. This particular piece here is a member of the Datos Sagrados piece, which is a database piece. 27.3% of COVID-19 deaths were Latino as reported by the US CDC on April the 21st of last year. That was weighted distribution. This is a repurposed a vintage wooden chair. It's a, ch it's a child's chair acrylic and colored pencil, I actually reupholstered it myself. The brown dot project was originally two dimensional database of data pictographs where brown dots on architectural grid vellum represented statistics about US Latinos and their contribution to American culture, professional sector and economies. This particular piece is one of my first database sculptural works uh, that represent this fact. So I draw a mandalic form on a piece of canvas or a piece of paper and uh, this particular piece here has 160 spaces drawn uh, times 27.3% equals 160 painted spaces on the seat of this chair. So the chair actually has a data pictograph included in it uh, regarding the, 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 the data regarding uh, COVID deaths. I'll be creating some more pieces this year about this particular data uh, as new data, yeah, as new information comes forward from the CDC. Next slide, please. This is also a three-dimensional um, data piece. As I said before, the majority of my data work was flat, and now this year it's becoming three-dimensional. This piece is called It's the Real Thing. Hispanics will fill 75% of US, new US jobs between 2020 and 2034. It's made up of a repurposed vintage glass. You can see a giant Coca-Cola bottle. Enamel, acrylic, and wood. It's 20, about 28 inches tall. In this particular case, I decided to place the bottle as 100% to give it the value of 100%. And you can see the data is 75% of new US jobs would be between 20,000 and 24 would be 75%. So there are 75 chocolate colored wooden balls inside this Coca-Cola bottle. It's my first one of my, it was my first database sculptural work. So the bottle constitutes 100% containing 75 milk chocolate colored wooden balls representing the fact that Hispanics will fill 75% of new US jobs between 20 and 2034 according to the IHS market uh, economic report 2015. I etched the glass uh, in Mexican style and hand painted it. So much of my work is not only about brown, but it's also about data. Next slide, please. This is called Beautiful Brown Bouquet. I'm now um, 
uh, investigating um, Victorian objects and uh, doing a lot of research about Victorian history and the beginning of uh, corporate America and how the Irish and also the Jewish and the Black and the Latinos were used to create the great wealth of the United States, how we were a part of that development, we we're a part of American history. So I found this beautiful Victorian, uh, actually it's a lamp base and painted the angels brown. What's wrong with brown angels? It's perfectly fine. So this piece is from 2020, repurposed antique porcelain enamel uh, with artificial flowers. The brown bouquet, the beautiful brown bouquet, combines opulent classic Victorian symbols of beauty and privilege, made brown to remind us of the many essential workers that have made affluence and power a reality. A lot of my questions are about uh, what I, um, California is 35% Latino, but where do you see them? They're in the back, they're always in the back, but they make uh, business possible in a, a, throughout the United States, restaurants, large corporations, all use Latin American workers. Next slide, please. Uh, this piece was just acquired by uh, the Latin American Museum in Long Beach, MOLA. I'm very pleased about that. This is also a data piece where I found an object in an antique mall, in this case, a beautiful uh, Victorian sort of Greek goddess, painted her skin brown and then put a data pictograph on her back. In this particular case, there are 31 spaces in the mandalic form, in the circular mandalic form on her back. Uh, and uh, times 40.6% means that there are 13 painted white spaces that you can see on her back, indicating the data that in 2010 and 2000, uh, 2015, Latino graduates grew by 40.6%, college graduates. This is very important for Latin Americans to understand who we are and what we've actually been able to accomplish. You can see the letters there, M-E-A-M, -E which means make them all Mexican. And that's the whole brown idea of making everything brown. Movie stars, goddesses, politicians, uh, the royalty, everyone becomes brown, even cartoon characters. Next slide, please. This is another um, brown piece. Uh, uh, it's a make them all Mexican jaguar Nahuatl tattoo. She has a Nahuatl tattoo on her chest. It's a uh, repurposed plaster, acrylic, 14 karat gold, a leaf repurposed pigment uh, on the backside, which you can't see here. This particular piece combines the politics of color and class with Latino indigenous values through the inclusion of a tattoo on the decolletage of a brown Victorian beauty. The jaguar is a symbol of the messengers of the forest spirits and the power of darkness. This was taken, of course, from research that I do because a lot of my work has to do with research about being brown, with research about the workers, research about the gross national product, research about the Victorian age. I combine research with the concept of, with cultural understanding to create works that are repurposed. And all of my work focuses on the politics of color, class, culture, and power. Thank you. Oh my goodness, there's one more and I'll talk about it because I don't think I have much time left. But this is one of the newest works from 2021. It's actually a small um, a box which has a living room set inside of it, which you can see is a modern living room set, which is all brown polka dotted. If you take a good look at it, you'll see that everybody is brown in it. And I've taken a great deal of time and effort to paint all these very small items. But the small painting on the wall is actually a data pictograph as well. One of the Datos Sagrados pieces and the number of objects in the piece indicate this particular data, which is 96% of US Latinos believe that the US is the best place in the world to live. So there we are in our brown modern environment, living the brown life, living the good life. And of course, there is also a Greek statue still in white on a small pedestal in the center. And finally, a mini brown Victorian dining room 2021, which once again is a one, uh, one to 12 scale. And I am going to be reproducing this in life size for my upcoming solo exhibition at the Museum of Latin American Art in Long Beach in 2022, where you will see a complete uh, life size Victorian dining room in all of its expanse and all of its opulence and all of its gorgeous beauty and power, uh, all painted brown. And you'll be welcome to sit at a brown table and discuss the politics of 
politics and color yourself. How'd I do? Thank you so much, Linda. Thank you. I love the doll furniture. Yeah, it's fun. Uh, our, our third, and that's wonderful too. Our, our third artist that we'd like to hear from is Maria de Los Angeles. Um, she's a multidisciplinary artist who addresses issues of migration, displacement, identity, and otherness through her drawing, painting, printmaking, and, uh, and fashion, textiles. She holds an MFA in painting and printmaking from Yale and a BFA from Pratt and an associate degree from right here at Santa Rosa Junior College. And so you she now lives in New York. My degrees. But her art, ah, that's true. But her origins are from, from Santa Rosa. And we welcome Maria to discuss her art. Hi, thank you, Estelle. And uh, thank you to the board also for um, contributing to my ex uh, exhibition last uh, in 20, well, the years have just gone by um, in 2019, pre-COVID. Uh, and thank you everyone who's here tonight. I cannot see you right now, but I looked at the name list and we're, I'm so happy that you're all here. And uh, thank you to the museum, Katie and everyone in the team. I, I'm really excited to be here tonight uh, because, the, oops, sorry. The Museum of Sonoma County holds like a special place for me. Um, and I was so proud to have my first exhibition um, at the museum and to hold that space together with other artists that have a lot of meaning to me. And well, let's talk about what we're looking at. So you're looking at me. I was, I was uh, made in 1988. Uh, no, I'm kidding. The mural behind uh, my photo of myself is, um, I, was, I did that on the wall with gouache. So it's directly applied and at the end of the exhibition, it got wiped. Uh, it was a temporary installation for the Schneider Museum of Art. And it took me seven days or so to make it. Basically just like adding lines and, and drawing to it until it was completed. And it's quite large scale. You're seeing just a section of it. And uh, it was part of um, a group exhibition that I did there as well. Okay, um, I think that was a still, it might've been a video, but does it blame? Okay, so my husband, who some of you know, Ryan Bonilla is a photographer and makes videos. And I've been playing around with the garments and he has, uh, has been uh, photographing them and taking videos and you've seen some of the photographs. And this is at Seabright um, in Jersey, at the Jersey Shore. Uh, we did this as well in Bodega Bay and um, different locations. And we're making a series of photographs that will be exhibited with the garments in the upcoming exhibitions. It's, it was actually windy and then I have I had a small friend with us, um, like a seven year old and she got to put the dress on and she was like, why is this dress so big? <laughs> <laughs> and I just decided to just show videos. Um, I know that there's a little bit of a lag with Zoom, um, but here is, I'm just working on a, on a painting uh, more recently during COVID. And you can see uh, some of the details. Sometimes my paintings uh, in the photographs, they look kind of flat or very little. So you can see the scale and um, you know a lot of mark making, a lot of layering to, to the pieces. Um, also a video by Ryan, but a little too close right there. Let's switch. Impressive. Thank you. Um, and this one's technically upside down. You also see it behind me right here. Uh, I feel like the painting could exist in any direction. You just rotate it whenever you want. Um, and this one took me a while and it's, um, it's uh, about 60 by 40. And um, I've been making kind of just enjoying myself, making really beautiful flowers and, and plants and just really layering stuff. I was talking with Donna about allowing myself to just create something for pleasure and for beauty. Um, so that's kind of where I'm at with these paintings. I'm just really just make, trying to make something beautiful and adding a lot of small narratives in it. So you can find things as, as you please. Um, yeah. Lovely. Thank you. It's acrylic on canvas. Um, and this is a mini. Um, she is 16 by 20 inches. No, 11 by 14 inches um, on canvas. So the canvas got pretty textured because I was doing a lot of brushwork. Um, and she's like a Guadalupe or like, I guess that would be more what she would be or kind of like I'm mixing Statue of Liberty and Guadalupe sometimes, but um, 
she's political and she has a flag and I was kind of somber when I was seeing all this stuff happen during the pandemic and all the police brutality and all this stuff so I decided to make a bluer painting so it's a little bit darker Um, and in order to like kind of rehearse the images or not rehearse them, but um, think of images, imagine new images I draw. So um, you can see here a watercolor on 300 pound paper. And actually this paper came from someone that was really meaningful to me. Um, my friend, Jim Spitzer, who was from Santa Rosa, he passed away. And he actually, uh, I inherited some of his watercolor pieces. Um, he always wanted me to use 300 pound watercolor paper which is very textured. And I think I finally learned how to use it. Uh, you have to really give it a lot of water, it's very thirsty. And so this is a, a drawing, an homage to um, a lot of the parent-child separations and undocumented um, children and you know just a lot of the narrative. And I, I wrote into, into the body. So if you have this piece, you can look into it and read. The words are in Spanish, they're in English. Um, so yeah. I guess they're kind of fantastical. They're not really real people. They're um, symbolic, um, but <clears throat> I really like, sometimes I feel like my paintings like this one are very textured. Sometimes I just want to let the material be more open. So sentimental. Was that it? Yeah, can we go back? I guess, um, what, um, do I have more time? Yep. Okay. Yeah, um, a little. A little. I guess I could open up if anyone has a question, but I could just talk to. Um, let's go back to, well, let's stay with this one. Um, this is one of a series. So I've been, I have several pieces in this style um, and I use some of the motifs in my other work in this. And one day I want to make them like, um, like 10 feet. Like I want to make giant uh, watercolors. And that's kind of what I'm doing. If we go back to the beginning with the wall drawing, the black and white wall drawing is basically a giant drawing um, blown up to a huge scale and except for that is on the wall and it sort of lives once um, but eventually I want to do um, I like the drawings by Kara Walker I think I like to use more color than Kara Walker but I like the way the scale that she uses um, and Leon Golub and Nancy Spear and I just like a lot of people who draw very gesturally in that way um, so maybe one day I'll get to do wall size watercolors <laughs> Maria, we have a we have a question um, that we might as well take on now, which is Maria, do you draw out your pictures first, then fill in with color, or do you just take the brush to the canvas? I do both. Well, sometimes I just apply color and I let it bleed. I just let it become itself and then find things in it. And other times I draw the form first. I think I go back and forth and I don't pre-plan the images. I just draw them as I as I go. So sometimes adding just color helps me think of things um, and and then I don't know where the, the drawing necessarily is going to end uh, which has been a new challenge for me because I'm working on some murals and I'll be doing a, an exterior mural in Glen Ellen uh, that will be unveiled in July uh, so that's really exciting and I hope everyone can make it uh, well, maybe we'll do virtual and physical but it'll be outdoors it will be on Arnold um, this is a big deal the whole town's speaking about it and I've been holding a lot of forums and meetings to talk about what people want to see and it's a, a kind of impressive time I feel like it's a time of a lot of responsibility and also a big honor to to do this because it gives me the opportunity to talk um, to bring in stories to, to bring the community together um, and I mean everyone and and really give something beautiful or something that has meaning um, to that exterior wall that in downtown Glen Ellen I kind of hope my first mural was going to be in Santa Rosa like my first exterior mural but Glen Ellen kind of won this one so uh, I'm so excited for it. I'm amused by your saying downtown Glen Ellen. Is yeah. there a downtown? <laughs> there is. It's a very small it's, town. Yes, it is. They all can. Everyone's so I, gonna see it from their backyard. The mural. Yeah. Um, that's wonderful. I think at this point we we actually have a couple questions um, that are overarching questions and and that might be worthwhile right now. One of them is about women and artists during women artists during the pandemic. That when you carry much of the family care responsibilities, um, has there been any change in in your work or in your ability to do your work 
since the pandemic. Anyone? Yes. Yes, there has. Can, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah? Okay, I didn't see it. Is it on mute? Okay. Um, yes, I have significant caregiving responsibilities right now, and I am only able to work for a few hours in the morning. And But, but I have, supporting that, fortunately, a very long 40-year practice, and I'm pretty good at jumping right in. Um, but the other thing, too, is that I think this has been just emotionally a very, very difficult time, not just in terms of the pandemic issues, but um, the, the toxic politics, the environmental problems, the fires, all the things that have been going on are, are burdensome to carry. And, and in a way, making art is a refuge from that, but in a way, it's also, I find it's also impacted by it, too. So, so. Anyone, Anyone else? else want to talk about that? Because we can go into a whole bunch of other subjects. So Linda, you, you want to say something or do you want me to say something? I was just going to say that uh, several of my friends have um, become depressed over the time of the last year. Uh, not so much, I think, I think because of lack of community the inability to share with other artists and community has been really difficult on several of my friends and it has impacted their ability to produce. At first it was like, oh, you know, three or four months we could make it through this, everyone's gonna be productive. But six and eight and 10 months later, many people are having more difficulty maintaining a practice without an audience. And I think everyone's really grateful for um, Zoom and for the community that's been able to be uh, come alive online because it's made a difference for them in, in order to be able to feel that they still are in communication with people who care about their work and who are interested in what they're trying to say. Yeah, and I have to second that. I feel like um, the digital technology that we have uh, right now, I feel like it would be very different if we didn't have it. Um, you know. We, we do have phones and we can call people, but it's really nice to see people. And for me, it has impacted, you know, the pandemic, my work. We were traveling a lot, a lot of our trips got postponed, mm -hmm. which I think everyone here can relate. Mm -hmm. uh, and then um, I don't have children or I just, my husband and I, but uh, we, you know, I've had like more time to, to work. Um, I feel like I've really had time to be prolific and, and get through some of my ideas. And then I've been teaching online which has been a challenge. Uh, so I think that's like a new one, you know, I can't really look at what the kids are making and um, they have to photograph everything and everything's on screen. Um, so it's definitely been a new, a new experience for, for all of us. So let's get, let's get back to, I, mean, I guess that's related, but get back to women in art. Um, Tell me, do you, do you think, and this is sort of thrown open to everyone, do you think that um, being a woman artist makes you a feminist? Are you a feminist already? Are you not a feminist? Or is feminism equal to a woman in, in the art world? Uh, I'd love comments on that. I think the subject of whether you call yourself a feminist is, is, is quite interesting in this day and age. Maria? Who wants to go first? Linda, I think you should go first on this one. <laughs> I am seen as a feminist. Whether I accept it or not, I am seen as one. And I am of the belief that uh, all communities are important. My feminist community is important to me. My Latinx uh, community is important to me. Uh, my community arts connections are important to me. So I easily accept all the labels, although I don't necessarily wear the monogram of anyone. I would say that, um, you know, the, it, it's, I think of myself as a transitional generation in, in a period of tremendous, tremendous change. I mean, it, coming of age in the 50s and 60s, which were a horrible repressive time, right? And, and trying to find your way through 
that to other models and then having the complexity. I don't mean, I, when, when, when you say feminist, I really don't know, I don't have my own definition of feminist. I, it's very slippery for me, it's very changeable. And um, if you're thinking, you know, and, and so I feel as though it's something that I'm thinking about a lot lately. I'm thinking about feminism, I'm thinking about how women sometimes adopt a male model uh, in order to feel successful in the world and, and sometimes don't, aren't respectful enough of more traditional women's roles and lives and whatever. It's, it, but it's, it's a, and traditional in the sense, I mean, a historic, I don't just mean like, I, I, it's something that I'm puzzling over a lot. The, the, the nature of, of your work in relation to female life. And I think Maria, you do such a beautiful job with allowing it to be alive and feminine and, and in this female, like generative, ancient kind of way that I think of it as kind of ancient model. And, hmm. and, and I, I'm puzzling over this to the day. I've been dealing with this question for 40 years and I'm still puzzled by it. Mm -hmm. Truthfully, I really am. <laughs> Um, okay. Can you, can you repeat the question again? <laughs> well, it wasn't, it wasn't exactly a question. It was sort of make, yeah, and, and you don't, have, not everybody has to talk about everything either, but it's sort of, you know, do you consider yourself a feminist? Um, is, you know, is, is being a woman artist sort of equivalent to being a feminist? Uh, you know, just take off and, and, and talk about it because I think that, you know, I mean, Donna and I are more, are more of the same generation that we've sort of seen a bigger, a bigger arc of history. But when I was, when I was um, in the, in the sixties and seventies, you know, it was when sort of, there was a lot of, of uh, interest in women and women's groups and that kind of thing, women talking to each other and not just mm -hmm. modeling their lives around men. And, you know, I think the word feminism at the time was, you know, it was fairly neutral. I mean, you know, that's okay. Now people rush away from it. So I'm just curious about, you know, your, your role as a woman in the art world, whether you consider yourself a feminist or whether that's something you rush away from. Well, uh, I kind of circulate in a lot of circles and I, I have, uh, I'm young, but I have a lot of friends who are older. I feel like my oldest friend was like 105. Mm -hmm. um, so I wow. like to hear what people have to say. Um, I think her name is Marie. You learn a lot from people. And I, I would say that as a person, let's not say as an artist, I am a feminist. Um, and I, I don't, and I think you might be thinking about like the feminist movement, which I wasn't aware of necessarily until I went to school in New York, I was more aware of everything. I think in, I guess the first thing that really shaped my life, I feel that being a woman, I'm actually in a different, I, you know, I'm in my thirties. So being a woman has been less defining in a way, actually helpful to me to be a woman, I feel, um, because people are nicer to me. Um, I feel like a lot, men have a lot of pressure and women have pressure too, but we are we don't have as much pressure from society. So I feel like I kind of got to blossom and, and people were there to help me um, to achieve that. And um, I, I am friends with a lot of people who were actually feminists during that time that you guys are speaking about. And I feel like at that time you had to really fight for everything. Um, in school, people were maybe mean. You know, I, I think we all get a little bit sometimes. We, maybe we get spoken over and people don't, men sometimes don't let us finish what we're saying. Um, and that happens to me sometimes. Um, I got told not to have kids um, if I wanted to be an artist. I mean, I'm not going to have kids anyway, and I, that's my own decision. I feel like, um, you know, I think that women's rights are being attacked all the time. I, I think a lot of women don't make the same as men. And, um, and then we have abortion being attacked still. Like, this country can't get over that. Uh, and so I am a feminist in all of that politically. Um, and my work does have women in it right and I have been depicting more men I think all the men in the room are like yes um so yeah I did like a dad um for the first time and my friend was like I really love that um I just I guess I do have the lens that I am a woman I feel like but no matter what gender you are you have a certain sense of presence so in in myself as a person I am female right I, I could also not consider myself female um 
but I just I feel like the new generation is like much more fluid about about gender um, about identity and what we're really looking at is like can you have the lifestyle that where you can be free when you can be free to express yourself to be successful to live a good life to live a, a healthy life and that kind of goes beyond beyond just gender um, for me, the most impactful thing probably was that I am a uh, Mexican, that I immigrated here. And I feel like sometimes my story gets um, cartoonized, like a stereotyped. Um, I feel like I, I, I want also to talk about my work. And sometimes um, we talk more about me coming to the United States or the fact that I am Mexican, um, you know, and uh, I think that lens is stronger in a way for me, it's a stronger barrier than, than um, being a woman. I'm actually happy that I am a woman. Mm. Yeah, does that answer it? I think I spoke I for too long. Talk to me, any, any of you about what career choices you've made um, that have worked for you or any, you know, it, it may or may not be anything that's particular to being female, but um, what, what are your observations on your career trajectory, if you can call it that, you know, the, the choices you've made that, that have been positive? Donna, I want to hear from you. You want to hear from me? Yeah, I do. Um, it's, it's just not the way I think about, I don't think about my career, I think about my work. I think about uh, the trajectory of my work. I never expected my painting to support me. And I think that it's very true that most artists are not supported by their work. I mean, it's great if you can be, but I think very few are in fact. And there were such substantial obstacles in the art world back in the 70s, 80s, 90s, especially the work I was doing was not related to what was the dominant aesthetic at all. I just, I, and my work has never been, um, I would say, just easily saleable. I just don't think of it. I, I don't, I, 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 it's, this is a hard question for me to answer in a way because I, I feel as though I'm, I'm, I'm sort of an art monk. I, I, I've lived my life doing work and raising a family and doing what I needed to do to stay alive. I mean, I needed it to stay alive. I needed it. And um, I, the, I've been really fortunate that along the way I've met some wonderful people who've been supportive of my work. And there's always been a niche in the, in the art world where that would be received. Donna, but, can you tell us? Of, but it wasn't tell, a career. It wasn't a, I didn't think of it as a career. Yeah, sorry, Maria, what? Can you tell us about how you got your first, uh, first gallery? My first gallery. Um, you know, it's really, how did I get my first gallery? <laughs> That's you tell me your, <laughs> they your were mentor. Well, my first, actually, you know what? My first solo show was in San Francisco and it was curated by Jeff Nathanson, believe it or not, many years ago. Yeah. <laughs> that was my first solo show right out of graduate school. And, and that, he's an example of someone who has believed in me and supported my work over um, over a lifetime and I'm I'm very grateful for that so yes you you have um you have people who jump in and say I see what you're doing I believe in what you're doing and I'll help you and 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 that's not necessarily who you would expect it whatever it's just it just so I so and and as far as like the current way of career building with 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 Instagram and social media and all that. I don't do any of that because I just don't want to spend my time doing that. It's just not how I want to spend my time. And so I, I have a website. I mean, I'm, I'm you know, reason, I'm fairly functional <laughs> online, but, but in terms of posting a lot of stuff or whatever, it's not how I want to, my work to be seen really. I think the screen is so reductive and I always hope that it's going to be seen either in real life or at, at the very least in a print form in a book or a catalog or something so that it has more juice. You know, it's, it's a screen is a very reductive thing. So 
that's a complicated answer to your question, but there it is. <laughs> <laughs> and, and it gives rise, and it gives rise to a number of questions. Um, so, Linda, do you think of your your career, quote unquote, similarly, or do you think about your work? Or you know, I, I didn't know that was a choice, but it sounds as if, from Donna's point of view, that you know, career is not is not what artists think about in those terms. I, maybe I find that many artists don't think about career; they think about production, and it is a choice, and it is a way of life but I, I do both simultaneously. I think about my work and I think about my career simultaneously. And I work on them both simultaneously as well. Yeah. And I have a, a practice in my studio and I have a practice in my office. And um, I reach out a great deal to curators and historians and scholars and critics and gallerists and do a lot of uh, sharing of the work, which is, to me very important that I have an opportunity to share my message with as many people as possible through solo exhibitions and publications uh, of all types. And so I, I tend to work both sides and I find it to be, um, for me, it's important to do both. Yeah, so <laughs> I love you guys' answers. I feel that, um, when did I choose this as a career. Um, I didn't really think I was going to go to college. So for me, because I, I grew up undocumented. So for me, it was uh, until I was about to be kicked out. No, I was, I had spent too much time at SRJC and hello, anyone from San Jose Junior College. Uh, and my teacher was like, what are you still doing here? And I, I had to tell him that I had to come out and be like, I'm undocumented. Uh, and, you know, and that's, I guess, when I decided that I was going to go to school. And I think that decision to transfer from San Jose Junior College to Pratt was a decision to be professional, to have a career in art. Uh, before that, it wasn't really, it was just something I loved since I was a kid to like draw um, and that I explore in, in high school and you know at San Jose Junior College where I had really fantastic faculty. I recommend it. And some people here in the room are people I know from San Jose Junior College. So, you know, that was the first time that I was like, okay, uh, let's figure out how to pay for this. I'm going to do this. And I had a lot of support. And thank everyone who's here who supported me for that. Um, and then I, when I graduated, when I went to grad school and undergrad, I thought of it, there was a kind of separation uh, from what was that interior world of the school and what was the exterior world, the world out there. And I think what they referred to was business. Um, for me, I felt that it is not just a studio practice or a making. Um, it's not just advertising at all, but it is also a business, it's money. And, um, and so when I graduated from grad school, I thought of it as like a career. Like I'm gonna be an artist, I'm gonna show in shows, uh, I'm gonna make work. And as I mature five years later after grad school, I really see it as a business too. And I had to come to see it as a business. Uh, and the art world has a lot of webs and the faster one understands that, the safer it will be. Um, it's a big ocean out there. Um, so, so for me, that's what it is. It's that I, I want it to be an artist because I think it's beautiful. I didn't really know what it meant because I'm the first one in my family to be an artist, like a visual artist. My cousin plays the piano and he's very good at it in Mexico. So I guess I wasn't really educated and I didn't meet Linda back then or, or Donna. So I didn't really know what this whole thing meant. I just wanted to do it. And, and I, I saw school as a way to, to, trans, to transcend the situation um, and to get out. Uh, and I, I love Santa Rosa, but I, I mean, you know, to try to build something out of myself. Um, and, and so now I see it as, as a business, as a big responsibility as well in that way. I, I didn't mean to give the impression that I just think of it as like a hobby. That's not the case at all. I work. Very You're not a hobbyist. You're. <laughs> and I, I I work very seriously. I don't, think, I don't think anybody understood that. And and and, and I and and I there absolutely is a business aspect, and the business aspect is very important for the survival of the work. Really, you know, archiving all these tasks that are major major projects and and fu functioning in a business-like manner absolutely but in terms of it determining what I'm doing in the studio there's a pretty clear separation between between them 
yeah I mean our aesthetic our purpose and our work what we want out of our work should always be separate right we want that's for us first and then for the world paramount yeah yeah paramount yeah absolutely now, Linda did you do did you go to school or go to do higher education in order to study art it's very sweet of you to ask a, a lot of uh, a lot of people uh, erroneously believe that you know uh, individuals of color don't study art somehow or another we're all self-taught I thought you had a PhD Linda I thought you were I, a PhD I have, yeah. and I have an MFA I didn't get a PhD in history but I had an MFA in the late 70s along with Judy Baca and at that time, uh, there was only maybe, I think in the nation, there was like under 20 women who had MFAs in the nation at that time. And so it's, it's important really? for us to, yes, it's important for us to accolade each other just for the data. Donna, uh, where did you get your degrees? Um, I got my undergraduate degree at Berkeley and I got a graduate degree, an MFA at the Art Institute, San Francisco Art Institute. Yeah, it's a great school. Can you talk about Berkeley? I feel like a lot of people in the room here would like to hear a sentence about the Berkeley experience, Donna. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's completely tied to the time that I was there. I was there in the mid seventies and uh, it, was, it, was a, it was skeptical at best, let's put it that way, about the idea of female artists being taken seriously. I mean, the, the, what, what I said earlier about there being one woman graduate student and one woman faculty member, it's true. Yeah. Uh -huh. And uh -huh. they had done their tokenist thing. And, and it was very, it was a very difficult place for me. I really struggled there. And, and in fact, I would say, and similarly at the Art Institute, actually, while I was there, it, it was tough. Uh, it was very, there was a lot of controversy. There was a lot of conflict. Um, I was glad I was a somewhat older student when I was there because I was able to step, I had enough maturity to be able to step back from it and saying, okay, what can I, what can I learn from this person and what do I need to ignore, you know? Mm -hmm. and, and standing up in some cases to people who were being out of line, mm -hmm. um, right? So. Uh, yeah, well, I feel like our- what, what do you mean? What was the, con what was the controversy, Donna? And what do you mean by <laughs> You're going to get me in trouble, Estelle. <laughs> we, can, we can just transition. Let's hear about Linda's education. Right? Let's hear it. Well, OK, I'll, I'll give you an example. A certain person who shall remain nameless, who was really, you know, I can't do this. because It'll be too obvious who it is. No, uh, I think I think I, I can rescue you. Yeah. Let's, hear, <laughs> let's hear about Linda's uh, no, you education. Know, I, I was thinking about Maria and what she said about um, people in school. Uh, telling her that she couldn't be a mother and be a, yeah. Yeah. a professional artist. And I remember in uh, graduate school that I was told exactly that same thing. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And uh, that uh, also I was, um, I got a job when I was in graduate school teaching art to children. And I was also told in graduate school that if I did anything besides sit in the studio, that I could never be considered a serious artist. I don't, I think it was just sort of window dressing around the idea that I was a woman of color. And uh, so they were- uh, I got the same thing, Linda. I don't, I think it's female and it's female, female and mother. Yeah, yeah. Being, a, being a mother I, in, I had a in guy that era. Sat in front of me in law school. I had a guy who sat in front of me in law school who, who said very loudly to the guy next to him, you know, what are all these girls doing here taking, our, taking places of men who should be here? Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, uh, I'm so glad to say there, there's a lot of change now and yeah. when you, when you ask the question about feminism, I, after ruminating a bit about it and thinking about, you know, our histories and what we've been through as women in the arts, is that the majority, with Jeff, is one of the great exceptions to this rule of the curators and historians and critics that have written about my work and shown my work have been women. Yeah. And I think if we look a little bit back on that, maybe Donna will have something to say about it as well. Maybe uh, Estelle, in terms of the board on the museum board and the exhibitions that are shown there, I mean, Jeff is the exception. Uh, the majority for myself have been women who have been interested in my work. And well, so maybe you, that Jeff's is- Jeff's married to a woman artist, Linda. You must know that, right? Jeff's married to a woman artist. So, so he has an understanding and a sensibility yeah. about it. But I think talking about our experiences, not only in higher education, but also accomplishments like Maria's accomplishments in higher education are really important in terms of 
of uh, destroying a lot of the stereotypes about what women are capable of uh, in terms of vision and uh, uh, capacity in terms of production uh, conceptually. I, I, I honestly think that a lot of this prejudice against women is this inability to see women as conceptually as strong as men. Can I add a note about that? Um, I just want to clarify, I do not have a baby. Everyone's asking me how my baby is. Um, I don't. And I, I think that sometimes, which brings me to the question. So I do have a lot of moms in my work and like motherhood and, and family and this kind of stuff. So everyone's apparently had this idea that I have a, a kid. Uh, I, I mean, I am, I am that age. Mm -hmm. I am that age. Um, but I feel like my work is kind of conceptually about something bigger. And I think sometimes uh, because the way we look or the way being a woman or just being the way that we are, people read our work a certain way. Um, they, they, they don't separate it necessarily. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. And the reason I brought up the higher education thing is because I feel like that's our first entry into the artistic career. So we get to see how people see us and that tends to be other artists and other faculty who are in the arts. Um, and that gives us as young people a sense of, of ourselves in the arts. Um, and if that sense is like damaged by prejudice or people looking at us a certain way, then our lens is already kind of, right. it caused some, some, um, some damage to our perception of what we can do right. beyond school. I, I think it adds to our credibility as well. I think it's very important to set credibility. And uh, each one of us have made a, a dedication and a commitment to our careers. And that first dedication really was to our education and to the years that we spent studying painting itself. It's like studying philosophy or studying history or studying data as I do, to be seen as an intellectual, as a woman, uh, capable of idea that could uh, influence society, that could influence culture is but that's what my goal is. Right. And to be taken seriously is is uh, is is the struggle. It's actually is Amen the struggle. To that. Yes. Amen to that. Yeah. Yes. So talking about you know our experiences and and uh, during the younger days of our commitment, which were probably some of the hardest. They were hard for me too, Donna. I mean, I was pretty much told not to go to college. I was told don't mm -hmm. bother. You know, and to struggle through everyone's. Uh, misconceptions about me uh, has taken a whole lifetime. And I'm proud of my accomplishments. I'm proud of your accomplishments as well. But I think that accolading women in this way is extremely important because to be seen as a serious thinker, you know, a serious thinker and a serious producer, I think is the beginning of the changes that can be brought about uh, for women in the arts. I know the people who show me and who write about me and who consider me for opportunities, think of me as a serious thinker. And I think it's important for us to see each other that way and right. acknowledge that. I, I really agree with that. And, and I think what I would say it, 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 expanding on that is feeling like a participant in the cultural conversation. Absolutely. And, and that, that to me, it take, uh, you know, uh, maybe participating in the business is the price of entry, but that, and that's got its whole huge set of problems mm -hmm. attached to it, right? Um, but, but participating in the cultural conversation is, is the, the idea. For being invited to participate, being yeah. invited to participate and being yeah. considered yeah. a valuable voice yeah. in the development of culture and society. Right. I mean, isn't that what, that's what I want as a human being. Right. Let's you know, put my gender aside. I mean, I'm married with children and grandchildren. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm proud to be a woman just as, just as Maria said, but my art is, is part and parcel of who I am, but it's more than right. just that. Right. It's more than just that. Yeah. Yeah, I guess that I second that, Linda. You said it so beautifully. I don't really know what to add to it, except for that, um, you know, it, it really has, people try, I guess it's very easy to just be superficial, uh, to just look at the person and, and make assumptions and glance at the work. And sometimes uh, because of academia or because of the world, because of the world, how things have kind of built up to this moment, uh, women have always been, uh, been not listened to as much. And we have a lot of history of women who have been very strong and formed lives for themselves and changed the world in many ways. So it's totally possible. But I think I'm grateful for also the fact that you, um, you both are artists 
and you're making art and you're you're building conversations and I mm -hmm. you know I benefit from every every woman or every person who considers themselves a woman um uh in, in the world from their effort um I think it's it's sort of a collective uh collective change and we're so many people in the world like mm -hmm. like we always I always thought we were less but we are a huge number of women in the world so I feel like in the future you know women are getting very educated um we we are getting paid better and better and I think we just one step at a time and we have a vice president uh you know our first vice president so we're getting there yeah I think representing is very important as well um I think um you know I look at my artist uh, colleagues um over the, uh, the the 40 years of my career how many artists have I known how many artists have I exhibited with how many artists have I spoken to it's in the thousands, correct? And the proof is really in the pudding, you know. Uh, who is who's gonna who's gonna stand up the longest? Who can stand the longest? And it's a it's a it's a battle to be an artist, to be a creative thinker, to be a creative producer. It takes a lot of courage and a lot of uh, a lot of energy and a lot of uh, uh, re reserves. It's interesting how much it takes from you. I think uh, when I look back. Um, there's just as many men as women who have decided not to continue, who have just decided that they can't continue. It's because of the difficulties financially, the difficulties of non-recognition, the, the, the difficulties of, 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 of not enough opportunities, uh, even financial when it comes to buying supplies and materials and framing photography and all the things that it takes in terms of the business level. But I think representing for myself, I, I, my, my final, uh, I said this recently in a panel is that I, I, I want to make a contribution. This is what I want. I want to make a vital contribution to the conversation that comes out of art and right. be able to stand up and do that. And the older I get and the harder I work, the harder I see. Uh, I met with Connie Butler one time at MoMA and I said, uh, Mocha, and I said, well, gee, Connie, I guess if I make it to 75 and I'm still producing at this level, you know, maybe I could have a career. And she said, Oh, Linda, I hate to tell you this, it's really 85. <laughs> and she was being honest with me. And I just said, Oh, you're kidding. And I said, I don't know if I can produce at this level with this kind of intensity and and care until I'm 85 years. I don't know. If, <laughs> oh, I, don't know if I've, I don't know if I've got it in me. You know? <laughs> that's the real but that's the real question and the real story to it, you know and and I look around and I see a lot of women like Donna that have a, have it in them that we have it in us and I think it's important to accolade as I said and to acknowledge ourselves as well as each other to say these things and as you know as I erroneously said it's, it starts with uh, giving each other accolades for our, the, the battles that we that we uh, fought in our education yeah and, how we became artists to begin with, yeah. which is, you know, so really- So people, people retire from being artists? Absolutely. I feel like we don't. I'm in my retirement. And, Absolutely. And I know it's different. I know it's different from working, but you know, do artists just have to do art? It's exhausting. Well, I feel like, what else are we going to do? Um... <laughs> Buy a boat. I don't know. Take up cooking. There, you know. There I do that too. Things. I'm a foodie. I do that too. It, there you go. <laughs> I'm a foodie. Uh, being an artist is an exhausting idea. It truly is, and that's why, as you get older and you're still working, people just they just can't they just can't continue. And if you look around, you'll see it. It's um, it's a difficult reality, and uh, it, you know, I saw Betty Zar recently at an opening, and it's just oh, thank you, Betty, for continuing. Yeah. Thank you so much for continuing your, uh, your real. Betty is so beautiful. I love and her. And you, and you, you look at her and you're like, oh, Betty, I know what you've been through. Oh my God. Yeah. Betty. Yeah. And that's where having some recognition and support comes in at a crucial point too, where you need a studio assistant, you need a photographer, you need these, these resources of people coming in who can help you do what you need to do because your energy is after all finite. I mean, you know, it, it, those, when I said I was felt like I was wrestling an alligator with those paintings, it was like physical hard work that was just like getting unmanageable. You know? And, and so you, and, and I 
and before the COVID, I, I was, I did have an assistant available sometimes, and that made a tremendous difference to just do the, okay, now we're going to crawl around on the floor and roll these canvases and do all, you know, like someone 30 years old with 30 year old knees, you know, it's uh, really and, um, a good <laughs> experience too, because I got to intern and that was fantastic. I got to learn from a really great artist, um, Joyce Kosloff. And it was one of a, a really good formative experience um, to mm -hmm. do that. Yeah. And so I think it's beautiful that mm -hmm. you have you you have interns and you also have studio assistants and yeah. Um, yeah. because yeah. there's so much to learn. And it's yeah. joyful to mentor people like that. It's a joyful mm -hmm. experience because you, here are these talented young people who you can encourage, for God's sakes, instead of discouraging them. Right? Well, you can't. But this gets right back to the, this gets right back to the first point, though, because you know, as as you've dedicated you know, 20 years to your career, 30 years to your career, 40 years to your career. There she goes. Um, it becomes even harder and harder to maintain the production levels. It becomes even more difficult. And the only thing, what, what sustains you is opportunities to speak, opportunities to present, opportunities to be included in publications. Uh, opportunities is what sustains you. Oh, they're interested. They want to see the work. Oh, I'm so glad I'm working on this portfolio. Right. Right. I'm so, I have this work that I'm working. On. I want to make it for this. And it's the, it, for me, I find it to be because I want to share the work because I want the audience for the work so that I can talk about uh, my, my message. When I receive an invitation, it, it, it bowies me and keeps me going right yeah well this has been terrific and i knew that you know it wouldn't matter if i asked a question or not that you guys would just sort of <laughs> keep it going and that makes it it makes it easier easier on me but um it was just delightful to listen to you all and i wish that we all had the chance to have a bottle of wine together right now but we soon don't. enough soon enough <laughs> Uh, Jeff, would you like to say a few concluding words about how much the museum appreciates all these people who are participating and attending? You just said it, and I agree with it. And of course, <laughs> thank you all uh, our participants. Estelle, thank you so much for doing a fabulous job um, moderating. And thank you to our attendees. Um, I do want to say a couple of things. Uh, first of all, I, I appreciate um, our panelists for appreciating the work of our museum and the work I've done to try to champion women artists. Um, it's interesting, Estelle, you posed the question about feminism because I consider myself a feminist. I am not the only man, the only male curator or artist uh, in person in the art world who is a feminist, but there aren't very many of us. But I think it's really important um, that we acknowledge that feminism is a movement that has gotten to us a point, to gotten the art world and our society to a point where careers are possible and that that has changed the um, environment in which all of you and, and women in general are able to do their work, uh, regardless of their career and, and, and the nature of their work. That being said, there's a lot of work left to be done. And um, so I think it's um, really important for us to recognize, recognize that feminism is alive and well. That's one reason why we have booked a, an, a, an exhibition for uh, 2022. It was supposed to be in 2020 during the Year of the Woman, but um, this is the exhibition Agency, Feminist Art and Power. We actually just uh, had a, a blog post created. You can find it on our website. Uh, this is a blog post uh, related to the exhibition uh, uh, on feminist, uh, feminist Art and Power, and uh, it was written by our guest curator, Karen Gutfriend. Um, we um, are really thrilled that uh, artist and um, curator and arts administrator, uh, my wife, Connie Tell, has been an advisor uh, in uh, a very important capacity because she is the former director of the Feminist Art Project and now serves as 
chair of the National Committee of the Feminist Art Project, which is alive and well wow. in this country and worldwide. And uh, I'll also mention that if you really are interested in what women are doing in the art world, Collective Arising is another exhibition we have scheduled for 2022. Uh, it is looking at Black artist collectives in the Bay Area, co-curated by um, uh, two um, fantastic curators, um, Lucia Momo, uh, formerly of the Berkeley Art Museum, and uh, Ashara Ekundayo. And you can find their um, presentation um, and on recorded video on our website as, as well. Uh, and lots, lots more great content. So check it out in the chat, everybody. There are links to all of these features on our website. You can make a donation if you're a member. Uh, I see some of you um, in, in our uh, participants list uh, are members and supporters. Thank you so much. And thank you to our crew, uh, Jenny, Katie, and uh, John for setting this up. And in particular, thank you, Donna, Linda, Maria. So fantastic listening to the conversation. And Estelle, thank you again. Uh, this you, is Paul. it. I'm sorry to bring this to a close, but um, here on the West Coast, it's dinner time. Uh, <laughs> Maria, I know it's getting late for you. Uh, thank you all so much and have a good evening. Thank you for this wonderful Thanks. opportunity. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you all. Yeah. Bye, everyone. Right. Thank you good so night. much. Bye, Thank you, Estelle.